So Google Stitch is one of the latest AI tools that we have available to us as designers. If you want to create a sort of UI design for mobiles and web applications, this promises to convert those or create those for you. There's a couple of cool little tricks a bit sleep, which I think are definitely worth mentioning. But in this video, I want to go over how to use it We'll take a look at it together, so the pros, the cons, and round things up towards the end. Now, first of all, I want to quickly say, I want to get your thoughts on this. Once you watch this video or if you've tested out Google Stitch for yourself, let me have your thoughts, comments, feedback, and ideas in the comment section down below. I'd love to know your thoughts. Anyway, let's just crack on now with the video and take a look at Google Stitch in action. Okay, so first of all, this is totally free. You don't need to have any kind of paid account to access this. There are some limitations based upon the number of actual iterations you can create in any given month, but that's basically the only limitation. So all you need to do is make sure, first of all, that you've got an account with Google and that you can log into this. I've already done that, and now we are into the Stitch interface. So let's quickly go over some of the key things here, because there are some important things to consider when you're using this, which will kind of dictate what the end result is going to look like. So first of all, you've got your history and some examples of things on the left-hand side, similar to what you have inside ChatGPT. So nothing really extraordinary there. You've got your main area then where you'll see the end result, and obviously you can drop in your prompts. You can have this work to create mobile app kind of layouts and also web web pages, layouts, and so on. You've then got what is probably the most important aspect here, and that are the two modes that you currently have available, standard mode and experimental mode. Now, at the top of the video, I said there are certain limitations based upon what you choose inside here, and that's where this kind of comes into play. Standard mode gives you more iterations. I believe it's 250 in a given month, whereas the experimental mode is only 50. There are also some other limitations. For example, if we're in standard mode, we can export as both HTML and we can export to Figma, which we'll take a look at. If you're in experimental mode, you can only export the code. You can't export any kind of designs over to Figma. However, experimental mode should give you, and I say should, better end results. So just bear that in mind as a compromise here, depending upon what you're trying to achieve. Let's start off with standard mode, though, first of all. Let's take a quick look. Now let's just add in a prompt. Be as descriptive as possible. This is kind of important here, and then we can see what results we get. There's my prompt. Now let's go and say it generate designs. Now this can take several moments, depending upon the complexity and depending on how busy everything is. So we're going to let that go and create our first sort of iteration. Then we'll take a look at some of the options we have to adjust this, see the results we get, and some of the other things we can do to sort of customize the initial design and then moving forward as we kind of create various different variations of that design. Okay, after probably about a minute or so, this is what we start off with. As you can probably tell, it is kind of fairly generic. There's nothing particularly mind-blowing, but then the prompt was pretty basic as well. It does have all the things I've asked for. Admittedly, it's not a photographic image of Matt, our fictitious designer, but it does have the other things that I've asked for, the portfolio and so on. So pretty basic, more like a CV than anything else. Now, before we go any further, a quick word from today's video sponsor. Are you looking for a hosting partner that takes speed and security seriously? Then look no further than Kinsta. Their hosting not only delivers lightning fast performance and top tier security, but also provides you with powerful MyKinsta tools. These tools are designed to empower you, making it easy to manage your WordPress site with absolute confidence. And when you need help, they have a WordPress experts available 24 7. No bots, just real answers and real support from people who understand WordPress. It's no wonder they rated 4.8 stars on G2 with over 740 reviews from satisfied users. This high rating and positive feedback should give you the confidence to trust in their services. Kinsta, the hosting solution that's fast, secure, and always backed by real support. Get started now using the link in the description below. Okay, let's get back on with today's video. So before we take a look at iterating this and making, making some changes and so on, let's take a look at what else we have here. Now, first of all, you can obviously describe your design and the changes you want to make to it, and you'll have a history of what you're asking it to do, and the various different variations of that design will all be listed inside here as well, so you can kind of flip back and forth, which is quite nice to have that history there. Then we've also got the ability to edit this, open this up in Figma, and we can say good result or bad result. So again, very similar to what you've seen inside lots of other AI tools. If we take a look in the top right corner, we now have these new options for controlling various different aspects of our design, things like the rounded corners and so on, which will impact things like buttons and cards and images and so on. 
you've also got the ability to edit the theme. So let's take a look. If we open this up, you can see we can choose between a light and a dark mode. So let's say, let's take a look at a dark version of this. And we're going to say we actually want to use a kind of red color. Obviously, you can choose a specific color, but I have found that it doesn't always adhere to the color options that you choose. Sometimes it completely ignores what you asked for and just comes up with some random color combination. So bear that in mind. So let's say we want to use the red color. Our border radius is, let's go for more of a sort of pill shape. And then we can choose our fonts. So let's say we'll go for something like Inter. And once you've made those changes, you can then say apply the theme. It's then going to apply those to the design, go back and reiterate what we've asked it for with those changes in appearance to our, our theme. And then it'll come back with a new variation based upon those changes we've asked it to do. And there we go. After a few moments, you can see it's made the changes we've asked it to. So we now have the red, we've got a dark mode color and so on, but everything else is basically exactly the same. Now you'll notice that things like we've got these sort of information underneath the images with the title and so on. From an accessibility point of view, not a particularly good color combination. Same thing goes with the buttons. There's a real lack of contrast there. So it doesn't seem like it's adhering to any kind of accessibility standards, which is a bit of a shame. You kind of think that Google would have all this kind of information on hand based upon the fact it's the biggest search engine and obviously it's grabbing the kind of information that it's using from what it can find on the internet. You know, that's kind of where it's getting it from. So it would be nice if we had those things inside here. But let's take a quick look at now what we can do. We've got the larger version. So cool, we've seen that. We've also got the code and the Figma option. So if we hit the code option, this is then going to give you all of the code to be able to copy this over to whatever you kind of want. You know, whether you want to use something like VS Code or something like that, it's all there. The quality of the code, well, that's obviously going to be debatable. There's an awful lot of divs inside you. So you probably want to take a proper look at that. Personally, I probably wouldn't use this to dump the code straight out. I would use something like this, not at this point in time, because I don't think it's good enough to just kind of get the ball rolling. And then I would open it up with something like Figma. So if we choose the Figma option, that will then copy this. And it tells you now you just need to go and paste it into a document inside Figma. So handily enough, I've got a blank document inside Figma. So let's just do that command control V. And there's our design pasted in. So you can see there's our design over on the left hand side. It is fully editable. And if we expand these out, you can see we've got some very dubious naming conventions to find every part inside you. But what would be really useful is if we had the ability to select a section inside the design inside Google Stitch, give those a name so we could at least have some kind of semblance of organization when we put this over into something like Figma. As you can see, it's just depth one frame, depth two frame, depth three frame, and so on. But everything is inside you, so you can come in right the way down, find the various different component pieces. You can click inside and select them as well. And obviously, all the options you have for editing this are available inside Figma. So it's a starting point. It's OK. It's pretty cool that you can actually pull this into Figma. And I think this is the point where I sort of need to make one thing clear, is that this is the first iteration that's being made public that I know of, and it's only going to get better. Do I think at this point in time it's in a position where it can rival a decent, a semi-decent designer? No. And look at the examples that are provided, which we'll take a look at in a moment. None of them are particularly awe-inspiring. So I think at this point in time, you're probably safe. But like I say, this is the worst it's going to be tomorrow, the day after, the week after, the month after, and so on. It's only going to get better. So jumping back into Stitch, let's come in and ask it to do something. So let's change something about this. So we'll just ask it to do something like make the hero section full width, put the heading above it, and so on. So again, once we've made those sort of suggestions, we can hit the sort of option to go and make those changes. And again, we just have to wait now for it to make those changes based upon what we've asked it to do. And this is the whole process here. It is an iterative process. You are going to start with one thing, unless of course you've got an incredibly detailed prompt, and then you're gonna go through and you're gonna kind of change things and tweak things to get it closer to where you may want it to be. So after a few moments, you can see now it has done some of what I've asked it to do. I basically asked it to make it full width with a call to action subheading now positioned above the hero image. However, it's obviously completely ignored that fact and put it onto the hero image itself. 
This is why I think it would be a starting point. You could take into something like Figma and then you'd make those changes to get exactly what you want. Or you could spend an awful lot of time asking you to do something and not doing what you've asked it, then trying to word it in a different way and kind of make changes like that. So let's try one more change and see what it comes back with. Let's say we want to take these kind of featured projects. We want to have more featured projects and have it in a bento grid. So again, I've made the changes that I want. It's now going to go and listen to some of what I've said and then basically ignore some of the other probably. So again, it'll be interesting to see how close this gets to what I've asked it to do, which is to create a bento grid to have the first image in the portfolio to be taken up two of the actual columns and then make the images bigger and set specific aspect ratio. Again, it'll be interesting to see if it actually does what I've asked it to do. And after a few moments, you can see it's basically ignored most of what I've asked it to do. So it's now reverted it back to a light mode where I didn't ask it to do that. It hasn't put, it's put five projects in, but it hasn't taken into account that I wanted a bento grid that has sort of the first one taking up two and then the rest taking up the rest of the space. You kind of think it would be intelligent enough to understand what I'm saying there. Obviously that is not the case. So I could keep on prompting this to get closer to what I want, but ultimately it's, it's average at best. So now that we've seen how this all works, and if we take a look at the history on the left-hand side, you can see each one of these now, we do have the history in place, which is nice that we can kind of switch back and forth between those to see the various different changes we've made to kind of a history of it. This time, let's change it to the experimental mode. And you'll notice that we now have this option that you can add a sketch, a mock-up, or visual inspiration. So you could easily find something you like, draw something out, just mock it up in whatever kind of way you want and upload that here as well. Now, personally, I found that the results here were very, very mixed, generally not very good. I was asking it to recreate a specific design and it kind of basically didn't. So again, your mileage may vary, but you will notice Let's just use this one, that's fine. We'll generate design. This time, let's go for a mobile design and see what we come back with. Say, generate our designs and let that go ahead and create things. Now, one thing that you will notice that when you use the sort of experimental mode, it limits or reduces the amount of options we have available to us. And there we go, after several moments, because one thing you'll find if you try the experimental mode is it's much, much slower than using the other mode. You'll also notice that the design is... Well, it's okay. It's not too bad. I mean, I've seen worse. But you'll notice if we come up and try to use any of these other options, we can't use any of those. If we click to open this up, we only have the code option. We don't have Figma, which is a shame because to be honest, the designs are not like they're any more comprehensive or complex. Um, but let's, let's ask it to make some changes here and see what it comes up with. So I'm going to ask it to make a navigation element on here so we can add in additional pages and not just a landing page. Again, let's see what it actually does and if it takes on board what I'm asking it to do and does what I ask it to do. It's added in a sort of navigation. It's not taken into consideration the text and so on. So it's it's average at best. Let's go and ask it to actually create the rest of the pages. So once you ask that kind of request, it asks you, do you want me to create the rest of these pages? As you can see, it tells you which pages, the contact booking and support pages, the ones I asked it to create for us in the last step. So it'll now go off and create those three additional pages in this example, hopefully following the same kind of design aesthetic that we've got in the first part. And after a minute or two, you can see this is what we end up with. And as you can see, we already have some discrepancies in how things look. If we take a look at this first one, this has a kind of pale yellow background, and then the other two have this kind of pinkish background, which is kind of strange. But they also have different navigation. This one has navigation for home, classes, and contact. This one has home, explore, classes, and profile. This one just has continue, which I suppose is okay if you're making a selection there. But all in all, it's kind of a little bit weird in what it ends up doing. So what are my final thoughts on Google Stitch. Well, it's free, which is a good thing. It allows you to experiment and play around and maybe, you know, you'll find certain prompt combinations that work really well for creating whatever it is you're creating. However, the thing that I struggle with the most here is the lack of consistency. They're very kind of lackluster. There's already AI tools out there that'll build a site in WordPress, for example, and the end results look way, way better than what we're getting here. So, I think it's a, a starting point. Is it a good starting point? Let's just call it a starting point. It's interesting that you can 
pull in the HTML and you can take that and you can do what you want with that. And you can also do the same with Figma. But again, I think there'd be so much remedial work having to be done, especially in the Figma setup, that I would question whether it would make sense to even transfer it over at this point in time. Hopefully in the future, it'll give us more control over the name sections. So there's less remedial work to be done. But do I think sort of junior designers and maybe intermediate designers in freelance and agencies and so on should be worried? Not really right now. Give it a year or so, I'm pretty sure that will change and these sort of lower end jobs will absolutely be either in jeopardy or gone. Because as I said at the beginning, this is the worst it's going to be. It's going to get better and better and better with every update with everybody that actually gives feedback, with the prompts that are being used, all these things that will help train the AI to get better end results are going to ultimately make those lower end jobs obsolete. But what are your thoughts? Have you tried this out? Do you have any alternatives to this? What are your thoughts on this and AI design in general? I would love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below. As always, all applicable links for everything covered are in the description. My name is Paul C. This is WP Tuts. And until next time, take care.